1 Samuel 13 and verse 19. And the Bible says, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them sword and spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, his coulter, his axe, and his mattox. Yet they had a file for the mattox and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the gold. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan his son was their found. First Samuel 17 and 10, here's Goliath talking, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Drop you down to verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, who delivered me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And Saul armed David with his armor, put a helmet of brass upon his head. He armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. Now, for a few moments today, I'm going to preach on the topic of what happened to the smiths. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, Lord. We ask, Lord, to anoint your word that we may receive it, anoint our hearts and ears to receive your word. Let us be changed to be like your glory. Step by step, day by day, and through your word this morning. We thank you, Father, as we receive it. Put your hands together one more time as you're seated. If you're here today, your last name is Smith. I'm going to pick on you just for a few moments. I apologize, but I promise I'll make it up to you. Smith is the most common last name in America. Over two and a half million people have the last name of Smith. But sometimes the name doesn't seem real. Matter of fact, if your name is John Smith, people think it's a fake name. And if you marry somebody named Mary and you're John and Mary Smith, nobody's going to believe that's really your names. But Smiths have been around a long time. We've had 45 U.S. presidents, but none so far with the name of Smith. So maybe the Smiths should get together and do something about that. But the Smiths have been around a long time. When they look at the great events, even in American history, I believe a Smith was involved in there some way. The Battle of Bunker Hill, Revolutionary War, they said, don't shoot until you see the white of their eyes. Uh, I believe a Smith was there in that. Uh, when the call went to go west in the United States, a Smith was probably part of that also. When it was time to win the space race or, or the Cold War, the great things that happened in our country was built on the backbone uh, of people like the Smiths. And as many of you are aware, amen, the origin of our names many times came from what families used to do. If your last name was Baker, maybe at some point your family was a family of bakers, uh, my last name is Stewart, so at some point there was some connection perhaps to being a steward or being a good steward of something. And those with the last name of Smith, uh, if you trace it back far enough, probably has something in their family line to do with being blacksmiths. And I didn't come here today to talk to you about people with the last name of Smith. Uh, but I came through the scripture when it says there was no Smith found uh, in the land of Israel. They were talking about blacksmiths. Uh, these were those who had the skill to make swords uh, and spears. This was a talent passed from father to son for generations. Uh, the blacksmith would know how to heat the fire just the right temperature, how to melt the steel in just the right way, and how to use a hammer to beat that steel in just the right pattern so they could create some sword and spears uh, that they could use in times of war. And this time, when the enemy invaded Israel and took over the land, they didn't take the king. They left King Saul in place. They didn't disband the army. They left the army in place. Perhaps they knew if they went after the king or went after the army, there would be such a revolt that they could not conquer them. And, and God's people were in the promised land God had given them. 
and perhaps they had figured out that they could not drive God's people out of the promised land. Uh, but this time they had a plan. Uh, they were going to find every blacksmith, uh, every person that knew how to prepare weapons uh, for war, and they're going to take them back to Philistine until there was not one person left that knew how to make weapons. Uh, the Smiths, they had a legacy and a heritage. Uh, they had a fire and they had a hammer. Uh, and I wonder how did they find the Smiths in that land? Uh, maybe by the fire they had in their house. Uh, maybe by the hammers that they were swinging the castles upon their hands. Uh, but somehow they identified the Smiths uh, and they began to take them out one by one. Uh, I propose to you today uh, being raised in this church Church. Uh, I've known a lot of Smiths. Uh, they were not flashy. Uh, they were not well known. Some of them were not even in the ministry. Uh, they were not involved in politics, uh, but they were the ones uh, that kept the fire burning in the church. Uh, they came early for prayer meeting. Uh, they stayed all night. Uh, the fire was always on in their life. It was always on in their life. Uh, they had calluses on their knees from how long that they prayed, uh, and they were the ones that were preparing the church for battle, preparing the church for prayer. That's why I came to ask today what happened to the Smith. The Philistine's plan was actually a, a genius plan. You see, because the blacksmithing skill was passed down from generation to generation to generation, and they knew if we could take out one generation of blacksmiths, we would tie the hand of Israelites for many generations because no one will be left to teach the next generation how to make weapons of war. And now you have the entire nation of Israel with the king and with the army, but in the entire nation of Israel, only person left with the weapon was Saul and Jonathan. I propose to you today, the enemy is not concerned how many of us gather together if no one is prepared for war, if no one has weapons of war, just gathering together is not enough. Look at what Deborah said in Judges 5 and 8. She said, there was war in the gates. In church of God, there is war in the gates today. There is war in our land. The church is under attack. And Deborah said, was there a shield or spear among 40,000 in Israel? There were 40,000 thousand people in the promised land, but no one had a sword, and no one had a shield, and no one had a spear, and he was not afraid of 40,000 people gathering together unless someone had a weapon for war. I'm not here to disparage the great job that was just done by our youth ministry team and the great conference we just had in St. Louis called North American Youth Congress. Uh, but I am troubled uh, because this year we made a booth called winyourworld.com. Uh, and as young people came through that booth, uh, we asked them one question. Have you ever taught a Bible study? Have you ever won a soul to the Lord? Uh, and many of them did say yes. And many of them have started P7 clubs and CMI chapters. Amen. That bringing their friends and bringing them to the Lord and taking them out of the devil's territory. But saints, let me tell you, quite a few came through and said, no, I have never taught a Bible study. No, I've never won somebody to the Lord. I thank God if we can get 40,000 people together, but if we are not ready ready for war, if there's no swords, amen, if there's no spears, if there's no smiths getting ready for battle, what have we done? 
Nebuchadnezzar did the same thing when he attacked Israel. 2 Kings 24, 16 records that he took out the men of might, uh, even 7,000. He didn't stop there. He found the craftsmen and the smiths. Uh, they numbered about 1,000 people, and they were strong and apt for war, but he brought them back to Babylon, I've come to tell you that the kingdom of heaven is under attack and the violent would take it by force and we need the smiths to bring back the fire to me. The fire represents the anointing. The hammer represents submission. We need some people that are hungry to have the fire of God working in their life. Hungry and able and willing to submit to God. And do what God has called us to do. I love the technology we have right now. I love coming into church and having beautiful screens and cameras and sound systems. But church, let's not forget we don't need that stuff to have revival. We don't need that stuff to have miracles. We don't need that stuff to see what God can do. All God needs is someone that says, I want to go to war. I want to make a difference. I want to reach my world. Reminded of when I was sitting there talking to J.R. Renzi, and he said he had a burden in the 60s because along the entire east coast of Florida, there was almost no churches. Uh, and Brother Pugh and Brother Yaden were the head of home missions back then. He went to them and he says, I want to drive up and down the east coast. Uh, I want to take pictures in every major city of barbershops, of buildings, of people on the streets. Uh, and I want to come to the general conference in 1965 and I want to show those pictures. Uh, amen. And I want to see church started and he was told that's a great idea if you can do that we'll pay to develop the film they gave him no money they gave him no budget he had no money I said what did you do what I, said, I don't know he said I guess I slept in my car but he drove up and down the east coast and they came to that general conference and showed those pictures and 27 churches were started all up and down the east coast people like Doug Davis and Wayne Huntley answered that call. That's all it took was one man to say, I am going to go out there and see what I can do for the kingdom of God. Let me explain something to you. The enemy is always going to go after whatever you think you need for the battle. The children of Israel thought that we're going to fight the Philistines. We need swords and spears. So the enemy said, well, if that's what you think you need for the battle, I'm going to take your sword and spears, and you'll never go to fight. If you think money is your problem and living for God and doing what God has called you to do, he will attack your resources. If you think your talent is the problem and why you can't do nothing for God because you're not talented enough, he will attack your confidence. Uh, whatever you think you need uh, to do what God has called you to do, whatever you think you need just to live for God and be faithful to God, that's what he is going to attack. And that's why he took out their smiths. That's why he went after their smiths. Then no one see what was happening when one by one by one the smiths were taken out. Then no one worry about the next generation of smiths, where they were going to come from. Then no one see what the enemy was doing. What happened to the smiths? The great nation of Israel was reduced to farmers. All they had left were shares and cultures, which are holding axes and a pickaxe. That's all they had. And they had to take those down to the enemy to sharpen your weapons. Let me explain something to you. Don't look to the enemy to provide your weapons. Uh, don't look to the enemy to approve of your weapons. Uh, don't look to the enemy to sharpen your weapons because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't need to have what they have. We don't need their approval. We don't need to fit in to their system. God has called us to come out from among them and be separate. God 
has already given you all of the tools and resources you need to do what he's called you to do. Some of you are struggling in your very walk with God. You take one step forward and two steps back. You're struggling with addictions and lusts and habits. I'm here to tell you today, you have what it takes to live for God. Uh, enemy has you believing that you can't be victorious. Uh, some of you, your marriage is on the verge of divorce. Uh, your kids are in and out of jail. The enemy has your back against the wall. You have what you need to have the marriage God wants you to have, the family God wants you to have, the life and ministry God wants you to have. He's giving you everything you need. Stop Looking at what you don't have, God has given you what you need. But the reason why the Philistines uh, let the Israelites keep their farm instruments is they wanted them to provide for them. They wanted them to pay taxes. The Philistines were in the land of freedom, the promised land, and they let them keep their farm instruments so they could control them and they could provide for them and be careful not to take your talents, uh, your tools, uh, and your resources uh, and invest them in this world system. I thank God if you have a good career. I thank God if you have a good business, but you cannot serve God and mammon. You will hate the one and love the other. Everything that God has given you, he gives you for his kingdom. Let's not get so caught up in this world. God's called some of you to the mission field, plant churches, teach Sunday school, teach Bible studies, do more in Atlanta West, but you're too busy with the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this life. I, I'm afraid the church, Pastor John says, gone too far the other way. You know, for a while there, we didn't believe in Christians having professions or being doctors and lawyers and teachers. And I thank God for apostolic professionals. We need more of them. I'm not here to talk against professionals, but I wonder sometimes we're going too far the other way. I'll be honest with you. I went to a Christian life college when it was an unaccredited Bible school, and I struggled my friends struggle, and I told myself, when I get married and have kids, they're not going to go to Bible school. They're going to go to a real college and get a real job. Now, the Lord has blessed my wife and I with three beautiful daughters who did go to school and, and, and follow their careers, and God is using them to use their careers for the kingdom of God, and I thank God for that. And I don't believe that Bible college is for everybody. I'm not saying that God wants all of you to go to Bible college. What I'm ashamed to admit that one of my daughters had come to me back then and said, Dad, I feel a call to go to Bible school. I would have fought them and tried to talk them out of it. But I look back now with my unaccredited Bible school decree, and I see how God has blessed my wife and I beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, we gave our life to the kingdom of God. We didn't give our life to God's kingdom to get money, to get whatever, to get a business. Uh, but the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Uh, and I'm telling you, I look back at my life and the blessings that God has given me that I don't deserve. Uh, and I'm ashamed to admit that I would not have wanted my children at that time to make the same sacrifices that I made because now I want to say, honey, if God has called you to do that, God will take care of you. You take your talents. Uh, you take your resources. You take all you have and give it to God. And you will never regret that. I was raised in the country of Liberia, West Africa, in the midst of war and so much turmoil and strife. And God kept my family's bullets flying through the house, rocket propel grenades landing in the house that didn't explode. And God kept us. But am I ready for my children to go to a war torn country also? I'm telling you, saints of God, it's time to understand that we have to make a stand. It's time to say, what happened to the Smiths? What happened to the fire? What happened to submission what happened to trusting God what happened to the Smiths let's look back at 1 Samuel chapter 17 the Bible says in verse 10 Goliath the giant came out for 40 days and he defied the armies of Israel give me a man that we may fight and Saul and Israel heard the words. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. 
You know, I used to criticize the army of Israel a lot. They stood on that hillside for 40 days. Put yourselves in their shoes. They had no swords. They had no spear. They had two swords in the whole country. They're standing here. Here's Goliath, nine and a half feet tall. Just the tip of his spear weighed over 15 pounds. His coat of armor weighed 150 pounds. Here's Goliath standing. You're standing there. One guy's got a hoe, you know. Guy next to him got a little pickaxe. Guy next to him got a rake. You're the army. You're standing on this hillside. I don't blame them when you look at it that way. I didn't surprise they kept showing up for 40 days, you know. <laughs> I'd have thought they'd stay home after a while. So the fact that you're here means something to me. At least you showed up. You may have felt like you don't have a weapon. You may have felt like you didn't have hope. You may have felt like you, you're on your last dime, your last leg, but at least you're here in the house of God where miracles happen. So they showed up. But guess what? A little boy named David showed up also. We just sang about him. And David said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait What's going on right here? We are the army of the living God. He said, I, I can't put up with this Philistine that's defying the army of God. Uh, now, let me explain something to you. The Philistines came into their land, and their land that used to belong to God now belonged to the Philistines. Uh, if you think America is a Christian nation still, I have some swamp land to sell you in Florida. We are far past bring a Christian nation. The enemy has come into our land and the enemy has taken over our land. And just like the Philistines were in control of Israel, the enemy is in control of our land. But let me explain something to you. Uh, as a conservative American, I would dream to be able to point to our political leaders in America, to our mayors uh, and to our governors uh, and to the White House and point to my kids and say, look at the man of God in that office. I'm so proud of him and now he's serving God and serving his country. Those days are long gone. As a conservative American I wish I could do that but let me tell you something. As a revivalist I am excited because I'll tell you something right now. Revival never happens when the church is in bed with political leadership. You have no way to look but back at the Roman Empire. Amen. When the, when the emperor was also head of the church. The church went to stagnation and uh, the political leadership agreed with us in this land today. I'm going to tell you something, honey. We would never have revival. Revival is happening in the Philippines. Revival is happening in Brazil. Revival is happening in Ethiopia. Places of persecution, access, challenge, nation. Revival happens when the church is under attack. So don't worry about that stuff. Say, I spend too much time online and cable news network and getting all depressed about the country. Spend more time in the Word of God and know the Scripture says, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my faith, I will hear from heaven. God's not waiting to see what happens in the next election. He doesn't care who sits in the White House. God can send revival if his people call by his name. That's the answer for America. But David looked at this sad situation. King before the king. He said, King, let me explain something to you. The Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion. The Lord delivered me out of the paw of the bear, willing me out of the hand of this Philistine. Now, you know, I used to really admire David. And I say I don't admire him, but I really admired David fighting the lion and the bear with his bare hands. But remember I realized when I started studying this, he didn't have much choice. He had no weapons. One well, like David was saying, well, I have a four-inch sword here and a six-foot spear here. No, I'm just going to fight him. No. David was in a place where it was him or the lion. It was him or the bear. Are they going to take some of his sheep? Sir? And David said, I'm going to trust God and I'm going to fight this lion with just my bare hands. Uh, you know, some of you, the devil's coming after your kids. Uh, the devil's coming after your finances. The devil's coming after your marriage. And you sit back and say, what can I do? I don't have nothing. But well, David said, all I got is my bare hands and God. Uh, and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Get to fighting. Get to swinging. You may not have a sword and a spear. It'll look like you have a chance, but start right where you are. 
right where you are. All I got is just my bare hands. But guess what? I got God, and that's all I need. So stop looking at what you don't have. Davis, I got my bare hands. And so let me tell you something. The same God that used his bare hands to kill that lion. I believe when he killed that lion, he was killing his fears. Because a lion roars and creates fear. He said, the same God lifted me out of this bear, representing his personal struggles and temptation, wrestling with that bear. I, I got some victories in my life that God brought me through. Amen. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. But Saul didn't stop there. He said, Saul, he said, Saul said to David, I'm going to give you my armor. I'm going to give you my helmet. I'm going to give you my coat of mail. Give you my sword. I used to, first I used to criticize Saul for giving his armor to David. You know what I realized? That was 50% of all the armor in the whole land of Israel. That was actually a pretty big vote of confidence Saul had. They only had two swords. So Saul said, we only have two swords, one coat of armor. But David, I'm willing to give it to you. But guess what David said? Saul, thank you very much. But I have not proved this. I'm going to go with what I have proved. Uh, I've come to tell somebody today, uh, you might be broke today, but I didn't stop Peter. He said, what? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise and walk. Go with what's been proven. The name of Jesus has been proven. The power of the blood has been proven. The don't worry about what you don't have. Go. What's been proven? I fear sometimes that we've lost some young men that have walked away from what we believe because we never gave them a weapon. They thought they needed a sword and a spear. And someone out there told them, if you have this size screen, if you have this kind of postcard, uh, if you drop your beliefs and change your standards, uh, then you can build a church. Uh, and because we lost the Smiths uh, and because they had no apostolic weapon to take with them, uh, they compromised what they believe. I'm here to tell you, let's keep with what's been working. It was a day of Pentecost, amen, when Peter stood there and said, men and brethren, what shall I do? He told them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ and ye shall be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let's go with has been proven. We don't need new armor. We don't need new sword. Let's just go with what's been working for all these years. But look what happened next. In verse 42, he stands up before the giant. The Bible says the giant disdained him. The giant ridiculed him. And look at why in verse 42, why the giant ridiculed him, because he was a youth. Rutting of a fair countenance. I found that interesting when he, he, he disdained him because he was ruddy, red-faced. Look at 1 Samuel 16 and 11. Samuel said to Jesse, these are all your children. I came to anoint the king. And, and Jesse said, you know, I forgot about the little baby David. He's the youngest. He just keeps the sheep. Samuel said, bring him to me. And he came in. Look at the next verse. He brought him in. And what does Samuel see? He was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint for this is he. What qualified David to be king? And Samuel looked at him, he's ruddy and of a good countenance. And what the enemy ridiculed in him was the very same thing, ruddy and of a good countenance. The enemy is going to ridicule what God values. What is in you that attracts God? What is in you that brings favor in your life? What is in you that God's going to use? The enemy will always ridicule, that is not enough. I've come to tell you something today. The Bible's called you to be separate. He's called you to be set aside. He's called you for a purpose. Let the enemy ridicule you by how you look and how you dress and what you don't have. But what the enemy ridicules is what God used to anoint you and take you to the next level. Look on down. Verse 44. The enemy said to David, Okay, little boy with the red face, come on down here. I got news for you. I'm going to take you, and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. That's what any of you said he was going to do. He said, anybody will tell you what he's about to do. If you're not full of faith, if you're not full of fire, 
You haven't been in that blacksmith room. Let the fire of God burn in you. That fire is the anointing. That hammer is submission to the will of God. If you get in a place alone with God and you let the fire flow and you submit yourself to God, God will give you a word that will take you against any giant. But the enemy will tell you, I'm going to steal your marriage. I'm going to destroy your ministry. I'm going to make you back out there hooked on drugs. I'm going to put you on these streets again. The enemy will tell you all kind of stuff, what he is about to do. But don't let the enemy do all the talking. When you got a fire inside of you, look that enemy right in the face. And David said, wait a minute, Mr. Giant. Hold off a minute, Mr. Giant. I got something I need to say to you. Mr. Giant. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield. But guess what, Mr. Giant? I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. I ain't got nothing but the name of Jesus. Some of y'all need to go home with nothing but the name of Jesus. Some of y'all too proud of the car you drive. Some of y'all too proud of the clothes you wear. All you need is the name of Jesus. You may lose that car. You may lose those clothes. But I ain't never losing the name of Jesus. And let me explain something to you, Mr. Giant. You said you're going to take me and feed me to the fowl, to the beast of the field. But let me explain something, Mr. Giant. I'm going to tell you something that's about to happen here. You've defied the God of Israel. And now, two things are about to happen. I'm going to have the Lord deliver you into my hand and not just you. I will take the carcass of the entire host, the entire army of the Philistine. I'm going to feed them to the beast and to the fowl. Devil, you thought you were going to feed me? No. I'm about to feed you and your mama and your daddy and your cousin, every demon, every M. No, you, you mess with the wrong one today, boy. You don't know who you're talking to. I'm going to feed you. And the whole army of the Philistine. But he didn't stop right there. In verse 47, he said, Mr. Mr. Giant, Goliath, sit down. I'll be right back with you. I got to go over here. He walked over there where Saul and the whole army of Israel. He looked at his, see, sometimes you got to speak to the devil. Somebody got to speak to the church. So he, he turned his back on the devil. He said, assembly, this is the church here. This is Saul and all the people. I came you to know one thing. The Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into our hands because the entire army of Israel, all they were saying, I have no sword. I have no spear. I have no sword. I have no spear. If I had a sword, if I had a spear, maybe I could fight a giant. They said, wait a minute, boys. You forgot something here. God don't need a sword. God don't need a spear. God don't need what this world got. This battle it's not yours. This battle is the Lord. Some of y'all need to stop looking at what you don't have. Some of you need to stop worrying about what you don't have because the God don't need that stuff to give you the victory that God wants to give you. So he said, church, remember, we don't got no sword and spears, but God don't need that stuff. Then in verse 49, he reached in that bag and he took out that one stone. And once again, he had my choice, you know. I mean, I, I, I admire his courage, but that's all he had. There was, no, there was no other weapons available. And when all you got is just that one stone, that, that's all you need. God will make sure you have what you need for your victory. So David said, all I got is a stone and a sling. He took that stone and he slang it, and the Bible said it hit the Philistines right in the forehead, and he fell down. But guess what? There was no sword in the hand of David. So in verse 51, David ran. Little old David stood on that Philistine, took his sword out of his seat, and cut his own head off with his own sword. I don't have time to tell you today, but around the country, something amazing has been happening. And city after city after city, from coast to coast, church planters have gone into cities and been given buildings and money and things that the enemy has taken for many years. I'm here to tell you, don't worry about you don't have a sword. He's going to take the enemy's sword and give it to you for your victory. But somebody's got to make a stand with what they have and say, I'm going to fight the giant. If all I got is a stone, that's all I'm going to do. One benefit of us living in an enemy land in America is if this was a truly a Christian nation, 
you'd have no idea where to go to fight the enemy. But because we're surrounded on every side, guess what? Your school is on the front line. Your home is on the front line. Your neighbor, everywhere we go, we need to go to war. Everywhere, not to worry about where can I find enemy. He is everywhere. So wherever you go, just start fighting there. Uh, Donald Rumfield once said, uh, you don't go to war with the army you want. You go to war with the army you have. Uh, I'm going to take it one step further. You don't go to war with the weapons you want. You go to war with the weapons you have. Said, preacher, what are you talking about? Look at Judges chapter 3 and verse 31. The Bible says there was a man named Shangar, the son of Anath, uh, was slew of the Philistines 600 men. Shamgar, what did you have? What size sword? What size spear? All he had was an ox gold. All he had was a cattle prod. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. Yes, yeah, Shamgar, would have been nice to have a sword. Well, I got a cattle prod to poke the cattle on. I'm going to take that cattle prod. I'm going to kill 600 men today. Just go to fight him. What you got? Just go to fight him. Well, what you have? All I got is a cattle prod and Jesus. That's all I need. You look at every battle that Samson fought. Samson never had a sword or a spear because none were available. Look at Judges 15 and 15. All Samson could find was that jawbone of that ass, of that donkey. All he had is all I got is a jawbone of a donkey. She would be nice to have a bow and arrow. She would be nice to have a sword. But all I got is a jawbone of a donkey. So if all I got is that, I'm going to kill about a thousand men today with a jawbone of a donkey. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Just say, this is where I am. This is what I'm going through. This is what I have. I'm going to get my victory today with what I have right now. It's all I need. If all I have is a jawbone of a donkey, I'm going to kill a thousand of them today. They got swords. They got spears. They got shields. But God can use his jawbone of a donkey to take out one thousand of them. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down a stronghold. Church! The children of Israel stood 40 days on a mountain being defied by the Philistines because they didn't have a sword or a spear. They were paralyzed in fear. Because all they could think about is, if I had a sword or a spear, I'd fight the giant. But David said, you know what? I don't have a sword or a spear, but I got five stones, five stones and a sling. Sam said, I don't got a sword or a spear. Got the jawbone of a donkey. Shame guard said, I got a cattle prod. That's all I got. I mean, I wish it was more. I'm telling you something. When you lose your fear of what you don't have, you open up doors of blessing you never imagined. I don't have time to tell you today, but in my marriage, I've seen that happen. In the church we planted in Tampa, I've seen that happen. In my business, we've been in business six months. We got our first contract with the National Football League. So how do you get a contract with NFL in six months? Just lose your fear. Take your cattle prod. Take the jawbone of the donkey. Take what you have and say, God, my marriage is going to be blessed. Uh, my marriage is going to be full of love. My kids are going to be saved. Uh, my church is going to prosper. Uh, my ministry is going to make it. Uh, I'm going to be effective at reaching my friends with the gospel. Just take what you have where you are and go to war. I came to ask you, what happened to the Smiths? What happened to the prayer warrior? What happened to the fire used to be in your life? You may stand together. The church of Laodicea had left their first love. Let's not be a church that forget the battle is out of just the Lord. You may not have a sword or a spear, but all you need is Jesus. The Philistines in 1 Samuel 13, they took out the blacksmiths. They took out the fire to heat the steel, the hammer to make a sword but they left the Israelites with a file to just sharpen their tools. Amy, Amy don't mind if you have a file. The file hasn't been a fire for a long time. The file becomes our process and our means. I, I'm all for that. Don't get me wrong. But you can spend five minutes with a file and come up with some songs for a service. Five minutes online with Google and chat GPT and find a sermon to preach on a Sunday morning. 
You, you could spend five minutes, you know, getting in the morning, barely praying, get, getting out the door. As your pastor said, just a list of petitions, just five minutes. You know, you can file the edge just a little bit, enough to break the ground. Not enough for full victory. That's enough to hack your way to make it for five more minutes. But I want some people to say, you know what? I'm getting a sword and a spear. I'm killing the enemy. I'm destroying generational curses. I'm tired of just filing things off and making it one more day. I'm tired of barely making it and just trying to file it a little bit more a day, just trying to make it day by day. God has promised you are more than conquerors, and he has a plan for your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to bring revival to your church, to your family, to your life. Throw the file away and say, what happened to the smith? I want the fire to fall. I want the anointing to be there. I want to be used of God. I want to give God all of me, and you'll be delivered from your sin and your addictions. You'll have faith. You'll have hope. You'll be willing to do and go where God will want you to go. What happened to the smith? God's calling someone back to the fire of a blacksmith today who's tired of a little file to get him by for one. But his altar is open right now. I want us all to come forward right now and ask God, say, God, what happened to the smith in my life? What happened? What happened? What happened? I'm tired of going through the motions. I want the Holy Ghost in fire. I, I, I want to be full of you. I'm tired of one step forward, two steps back. I'm tired of struggling with addictions and sense and habits, but I'm full of the fire for God. What happened? What happened? No sword, no spear. Don't matter. David said, don't matter. No sword, no spear. The enemy's got you thinking, no, you don't need nothing. You have what you need. Victory is in your hands. If all you got is bare hands, take on the line and the bear. That's all you got. That's all you need. Victory is here if you'll grab it. What happened to the Smith? Let's bring them back today in Jesus' name.